Okay, so I want to continue along with uh, our current theme, which is um, sort of applying what we know about protein synthesis and, and genetics and um, give you some modern real world examples. Again, you know, I'm thinking about things that you know, a student in Bio 101 might have heard about, um, you know, a non-biologist might, might have heard about or have experience with and, and sort of try to help you understand these things in a little bit uh, better detail. And so we're going to talk about transgenic organisms. You might be more familiar with the term GMO, gen genetically modified organism. And so you've probably heard of GMOs. Um, so let's talk about them a little bit and relate them to what we've been learning about protein synthesis. And so I want to talk about transgenic organisms, uh, bacterial production, GMO examples, and horizontal gene transfer. Just, um, you know, I, we could do a whole semester on this entire topic. Again, I just want to try to give you some examples to help relate this to things that you may have heard or things you may know. You'll recall that we made a big deal about the fact that the genetic code is universal. And this is a fascinating truth about living things, is that every living thing um, you, you know, transcribes DNA into RNA and then translates that into protein using the exact same codons and the exact same amino acids. And then what this means then is that you can take a gene from one species, put it in the chromosome of another species, and it'll work because that mechanism is the same for all living things. And so that new gene becomes part of the new species chromosomes, and that's what we call a transgenic organism or a genetically modified organism. And so once that gene is in the new species, it can be transcribed and translated just like any other gene because this universal genetic code among all living things. Now, let me make it clear that there are lots of practical issues here, right? It's just not something you can't just put them in a test tube and shake it up and it's all good. It's a complicated technique and that geneticists, you know, need to go to school and go to university and work in a research lab and, and, and so it's not something that anybody can do, but it's also not at all uncommon. In fact, this is probably the biggest, fastest growing area in biology right now. And so like, how do you get the gene into the new species? And where does it go in their genome? That makes a difference. Remember, we talked about promoters turning genes on and off. How do you turn this new gene on? How do you turn it on only when you want it turned on? Are there side effects? You know, there's this new protein in this organism. There's lots of practical procedures here. But at its basis, it's, it's simple because every living thing uses this code universally. So first example is a, a common one, and it's, um, you've got example of this in your book. Transgenic bacteria, for example putting a gene from one species into a bacterium and letting the bacterium transcribe and translate that gene. And so for example, you could take a gene from a mammal, put it in a bacterium and it will function. So, you know, it's hard to find two organisms that are more different, right? You know, you're a mammal, other mammals compared to a bacterium. So you're talking about a eukaryotic organism, putting a gene into a prokaryotic organism and it still works. And that's again, pretty cool if you ask me. A great example is bovine growth hormone, BGH. And so you've got the BGH gene, which makes the BGH protein, and that protein acts as a hormone. So remember that proteins can do lots of different things in your body. One of the things they can do is act as a hormone, which is a chemical signal. And so if you put this BGH protein into cows, that stimulates milk production. And so dairy farmers have an interest in this, that if we can increase BGH levels, then we can increase milk production. And um, 
you know, this is no different than, than you know, you're familiar with humans and taking steroids to get bulked up or whatever. Uh, manipulating hormone levels can manipulate cell growth and production. And, and so, you know, the ethics of that is a whole different subject. I'm talking about the biology of it. And this is a common thing that's done in agriculture and dairy production to give these cows uh, this hormone to increase their milk production. Now, typically, you know, where do you get BGH from? Well, you get it from cows. Cows make it naturally. They have this BGH gene. And so you have to go and extract it from cows and, and, and purify it and then inject it into other cows. Well, that's a long, slow, expensive process. But if you take that gene and you put it in a bacterium, we know that it'll work because of the universal genetic code, bacteria grow quickly and they grow cheaply. They don't eat a lot. And those bacteria that now have this gene will transcribe the BGH gene into RNA and then they'll translate that RNA into the BGH protein. And so the bacteria will produce the BGH protein, but of course bacteria grow quickly easy, you know, don't take up a lot of space, you can produce a lot of protein in a short time very inexpensively. And so here's an example, here's the figure from your book kind of showing this. And so they uh, take, you know, and isolate a cow cell, um, remove this gene, insert it into uh, uh, the bacteria, and the bacteria produce the gene product. And so, you know, f from here on out, it's just engineering. It's just, you know, there are practical aspects. Um, but again, these laboratory techniques are, are quite common this day. What, one way you can do this is you, you cut the gene, you cut the chromosome of the cow with a particular enzyme. Um, and they're called, there's, there's types of enzymes called restriction endonucleases. Anyway, they, they're, these, these are enzymes whose job is to cut DNA. And when they cut DNA, they often lead these unique sequences. They, they cut at a particular sequence and it leaves a particular sequence on the end of where they cut. And those are sometimes called sticky ends. And then if you cut the bacterial DNA with the exact same enzyme, it will cut the bacterial DNA at the same sequence and leave the same sticky ends. And so, Though you mix the two together, you mix the cow gene that's got sticky ends with the bacteria DNA that's got sticky ends. And because the DNA can match up and, and pair up like DNA does, that new gene will fit into the bacterial DNA because it's got matching sticky ends. That's just, it, that's a, just a broad overview of how one way you can do this. And so that will insert this mammal gene into bacterial DNA. And so then the bacteria will grow and divide and reproduce. And of course, when they do that, they have to make copies of their DNA, but they'll at the same time be making copies of this cow gene. And they'll transcribe the BGH gene and they'll make, uh, they'll translate that and, and make a lot of the BGH protein quickly and cheaply. And so this is a common um, way to use transgenics, is to put genes in bacteria because the bacteria can produce lots of a particular protein quickly and cheaply. And so it's not just bovine growth hormone. Um, this has been used to create insulin for humans, right? So diabetics need to inject themselves with insulin. And so this is a way to create a bunch of insulin very cheaply. Um, blood clotting factor, things like that. So there's lots of different proteins that have been created by splicing them into bacteria. Okay, so that's one example of a GMO. Let me just give you more. I could, we, we, again, we could do a whole semester on this. And I'm just trying to give you some examples that I think are interesting or that you may have heard of. And so many organisms have had genes spliced into them, right? Not just bacteria. Um, GMOs are very common, probably more common than you think. 
most crops in the U.S. are genetically modified. Uh, the United States uses more genetically modified crops than any country on earth, and so you may not realize that, but you are familiar with genetically modified organisms um, if you live in the United States. A good example is Bt corn. And so, whereas in my last example, we put a, a gene from a mammal into a bacterium, in this example, we'll we're taking a gene from a bacterium and putting it into corn. And that's what Bt corn is. So what exactly, what's the point of the Bt corn? Um, Bt stands for Bacillus thuringiensis. And that's just a species of bacteria. Um, I think it's naturally found in soil. And the uh, Bacillus bacterium has natural protection from some insects. And so it's protected uh, or, or it, it can kill certain insects. Um, and those same insects also prey on corn. How can a bacterium protect itself from an insect, right? Because a bacterium is quite a bit smaller than an insect. Well, it has a gene and this gene produces a protein that's what genes do. And that protein binds to the gut wall in certain insects and causes their gut wall to break down. And so if this bacterium is ingested by this particular insect, the protein that's produced by that bacterium will cause that insect's gut wall to break down and it'll kill the, kill the insect and the, uh, you know, I don't know the details here, I guess the bacterium then is not digested and can survive. I'm, I don't know the, the exact process here, but you get the idea that the bacterium produces, has a gene that produces a protein that kills an insect from the inside out. Okay, so we took that gene that makes that protein from the uh, bacillus bacterium and spliced it into corn. Now the corn can produce that same protein. And so if those insects eat the corn, then the same thing happens, is that protein gets in their gut, breaks down their gut wall, and kills them. And so you've given this corn, uh, you know, a, it produces its own insecticide. And so that's a common genetically modified organism that you're gonna find here in the US. Uh, here's another example. This is also, uh, I think there's, this is in your book too, transgenic Atlantic salmon. So in this picture, you see you've got two salmon here. These two salmon are the same age, right? The one, the bit, one is transgenic and one isn't. So these transgenic salmon grow really, really big, really, really quickly. Um, and so this is one of the, this is the first uh, GMO animal to be considered for sale in the United States. And it uh, it, it got approval from the FDA. I don't know exactly where the approval is now, but this is the first animal, right? Uh, transgenic plants have been common for a long time. And so, how is this fish modified? Um, a growth hormone gene from a Chinook salmon was spliced into this Atlantic salmon, so those are two different species, and also a promoter from a third species. So this third species is called an ocean pout. That's a different species of fish. The promoter from that ocean pout was spliced in with this growth hormone gene from a Chinook salmon. Those were put into this Atlantic salmon. So that's how the Atlantic salmon was modified. Now, remember what a promoter does, right? The promoter is where RNA polymerase attaches to start transcription of a gene. So the first step in transcribing a gene is finding the gene and attaching to the DNA. And the promoter is what allows the enzymes to do that. Some promoters work better than others. You remember the promoter kind of turns a gene on and turns a gene off. And if you can bind to the promoter, that turns the gene on. And if you can't bind to the promoter, that sort of turns the gene off. Some promoters are better at this than others. This ocean pout promoter is very good. And so consequently, by putting this promoter in with this other gene, you're going to make that gene be transcribed a lot more often. So you're going to produce a lot more protein from that gene. And that gene happens to be a growth hormone from a Chinook salmon. And that, just like the BGH example, it's a hormone that 
stimulates the division of cells and stimulates growth. And so in this way, you're producing a lot more of this growth hormone in these Atlantic salmon. And the, the Chinook salmon is a lot bigger salmon than the Atlantic salmon. So that hormone really influences growth a lot more than the growth hormones, the natural growth hormones in the Atlantic salmon. So you're putting in a more, you know, a better growth hormone and you're making more copies of it. That's why the fish grows so big. Now, one of the concerns that we often talk about with GMOs are their ecological effects. So you've got these modified organisms and you're putting them out in nature. How is that going to affect all the other non-modified organisms? And that's something that's definitely worth talking about. And so one of the concerns here is what if these transgenic salmon escape and breed with regular, non-modified salmon. Well, they're, they can't. So these fish have been modified another way genetically to make them triploid. And that means they've got an extra set of chromosomes. So, you know, you're diploid, right? You've got two of every chromosome. A triploid organism has three of every chromosome. And if you've got an odd number of chromosomes, then during meiosis, they don't partition equally. And so you have uh, a, a lot of issues when you're trying to make the gametes and the sex cells. And so those organisms are sterile. And so this is commonly done in fish. You produce triploid fish that should be sterile and that can't breed with other organisms. And so that's one of the ways you're trying to address this concern about this genetically modified salmon. Um, if it's triploid, then theoretically it shouldn't be able to breed with other um, existing salmon. Um, and so there you go. Um, another example, transgenic strawberries and this believe it or not, also involves fish. So strawberries and fish, how does that work? Well, there are some arc fish. Um, for example, there's a fish called the crocodile fish, and they have what are known as antifreeze proteins. Um, these are proteins whose whole job is to create, to keep ice crystals from forming in the blood and from forming in cells, okay? So let's go back to what we know about water and ice and things like that. Um, well, let's do that in a second. These proteins are designed to stop ice crystals from forming, and they come, of course, from genes. And so this gene was taken from an Arctic fish and spliced into strawberries. Now the strawberries produce the antifreeze protein. Why do that? Because it stops ice crystals from forming inside the strawberries. But what do you know about ice? When it forms, it expands, right? If you have ice crystals forming in the cells of strawberries, then that expands and bursts the cells. And the strawberries, uh, if their cells are bursting, they don't do very well and they get mushy. And so by putting these antifreeze proteins in the strawberries, you stop ice crystals from forming and the strawberries can survive colder temperatures better. And so that's the whole idea. To try to help strawberries survive, you know, if there's a, if there's a cold snap, if there's an unexpected frost, potentially you won't lose all your strawberries because they're producing antifreeze proteins which protects them from freezing. That's the theory. So now let's go back to what we know about water and why does all this work? Remember that as water gets cold, its molecules pack tighter together. That's what all molecules do. But if it gets very cold, those molecules start to form a crystal lattice and the molecules aren't as close together. This is why ice has less density than water and this is why ice floats. And so as water cools down, it actually gets less dense, not more dense. And that's, you know, some, some uh, uh, molecules do this. Water, this is a very important property of water specifically. 
And so you remember that the density of water is maximum at four Celsius. So as water gets colder, it gets more and more dense. The molecules get tighter and tighter. And at four, you've got your maximum density. But as you get even colder, they start to form this crystal lattice. And so then ice is a full crystal lattice of water molecules, which is less dense. The molecules have moved apart and ice floats. And so when this happens, that can be a very strong force. That ice is becoming less dense. This crystal lattice is being formed. That can be a tremendous force because you've got a lot of water molecules that are pushing out to form this lattice. And so this is something that's well known, something like frost heave, right? This is where you get potholes from. And this is why you've got to be careful when you build a house, right? So that uh, expanding ice in the ground is creating a tremendous force and, and that can, you know, bust up roads and move foundations. And so um, it can be a significant factor. Now, if this ice lattice, which can break roads and things, forms inside cells of things like strawberries, it can easily burst those cells. And so a burst cell, if you've got strawberries and lots of burst cells, of course they can't function well, but it also, that's what makes food mushy. And so if you have something and you pull it out of the freezer and you let it thaw, and then you put it back in the freezer and you let it thaw again, it gets real mushy. That's because you got these ice crystals forming that's causing the cells to break. And now, if you've got something like strawberries that you're trying to grow and sell at, at, at the grocery store and they get frozen and they get mushy, well, you're going to throw them out. People aren't going to eat them. Anything that can stop that ice lattice from forming will stop the ice from forming, will stop it from expanding, and will retain the proper texture of the food. The food won't be mushy. And so if you put those antifreeze proteins in strawberries, the ice doesn't form in the strawberries and the strawberries aren't mushy. And the same reason why you can use salt to clear roads and sidewalks, right? The salt keeps the lattice from forming, keeps the ice from forming. And so that's the idea behind putting a fish gene in a strawberry. And so the fish antifreeze gene makes a protein which disrupts the lattice. And so that's good for the fish because the fish lives down in the Arctic in very, very cold water and keeps the fish's blood from freezing. But it also keeps the transgenic strawberry from freezing. And so that's an example of a genetically modified strawberry. There you go. Now, there's a lot of more research into this and a lot of different ways this happens. And, and this fish gene maybe doesn't work as great as they'd hoped in strawberries, but there are other plants that produce these antifreeze proteins and moving the, the gene from a plant to a strawberry maybe works a little better, but you know, this, there's a whole lot more to this and I'm just not an expert on it. Okay, here's another example of uh, splicing a gene into a plant, um, something called golden rice. And this is um, kind of a famous example of a GMO. And so in this example, it's taking a gene that makes beta carotene. And so this gene was taken from daffodils and splicing it into rice. And beta carotene, you know, can give a pigment. And so it gives the rice this golden color, which you can see the, the far picture here, you know, the front picture, the closer bowl is typical rice, which is white. This golden rice has a golden color because of this beta carotene. So you put this beta carotene gene in rice, the rice produces beta carotene. What's the point, you know, why? Why do we want beta carotene in rice? It's a precursor to vitamin A. And there are lots of uh, places where humans don't get enough vitamin A in their diet. Vitamin A deficiency can be a problem in certain parts of the world. And if those parts of, you know, if in those cultures, if they eat a lot of rice, well, you put this beta carotene gene in rice, now they can get the, the people can get that in their diet and this is a way to get vitamin a to a lot of people who are lacking it in their diet just by splicing this daffodil gene into rice um now let me relate all this again to things that we've talked about in this class um 
you know, a big part of agriculture and human history is selective breeding. Purposely taking organisms and breeding them together to emphasize desired traits. And that's called selective breeding. And so, you know, if you have a dog and you, you know, there's all these different breeds of dogs. And so if you want a dog and you're like, man, I need a dog that, you know, likes the water and, and loves to retrieve stuff so I can do duck hunting. And so you've got a couple dogs and, and they have puppies and, and you find the ones that are the best at retrieving things in water and you breed them together. And from those puppies, you find the ones that are best at retrieving things in water and you breed them together and you do that and you do that and eventually you get a Labrador retriever. You can emphasize traits that you want selectively breed by, by selectively breeding organisms with those traits. And if you look at all of agriculture, if you look at corn, you know, corn ears are enormous. But if you look back to the, the initial breeding of corn in Mexico, the uh, early species that corn came from, the, the ears were, were small. And, and, but through selective breeding, you can rapidly select for bigger and bigger ears of corn, for example. And um, this is what humans have done in agriculture for, you know, uh, thousands of years. And so by selectively breeding for certain traits, you can emphasize those traits. So for example, you're probably familiar with kale or Brussels sprouts or cabbage or broccoli or kohlrabi, but those are all the same species of plant. Those are all a form of wild mustard. It's just that you took some wild mustard plants and that had you know bigger leaves and bred them together and then took their offspring and bred and just constantly selectively bred those that had the biggest leaves and you end up with kale. But other people might be like, well, I'm, I'm more interested in the flowers. And so you take the offspring that have the biggest flowers and you breed them and then you take their offspring with the biggest flowers and you keep selecting those that have the biggest flowers and eventually you end up with broccoli. That's what selective breeding does. And you can rapidly get very different organisms with very different traits by selectively breeding. And again, all these pl uh, 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 plants that you're familiar with, they're all actually the same species. They've just been bred differently. And it just shows the variety and the variation you can get by selective breeding. And so, um, you know, humans find these traits that they want and selectively breed for them, but where do those new traits come from? Remember what we have talked about. New traits come from mutations. And mutation is a word that sort of has a negative connotation, but mutation is just a change in the DNA. And certainly a lot of times when you change the DNA, that's detrimental to the organism. But every once in a while, that creates a new protein and a new trait. And so where do the new traits come from? A mutation creates a new allele. And then selective breeding makes that allele more common. So an example of this is carrots, right? This is what the original carrot looked like. They're purple. Now you think you know, carrots are orange, but original carrots were purple, but then they were selectively bred to become orange. And I think it has something to do with like the color of ro uh, the the color of royalty and, and like the Dutch color of royalty is orange or something. I don't know all the details. My point is, original carrots were purple. Now they're orange. How did that happen? Well, at some point, this beta carotene gene, the same one we talked about earlier, um, popped up due to a mutation. There was a mutation somewhere in the gene that caused a new allele that produced a new pigment. And this new pigment was attractive to humans, and so it became more common due to selective breeding. And now most of the carrots you find have this new allele. Well, how is that any different than taking the allele and putting it into rice? It's the same gene in the same way, right? Well, some people say there is a huge difference, right? Because when you do selective breeding, there's lots of genes, and you're, you're uh, selectively breeding not just that that beta carotene gene but a lot of genes that come with it whereas with genetically modified organisms you're only taking a single gene that's a good point but ultimately 
it is the same gene and it's producing the same product. And so that's one of the things that I want you to take away from this lecture is that um, uh, we'll talk about it more in a little detail here in a second, but GMOs kind of have, are, have a negative reputation sometimes and people think that they're automatically just a bad thing and they're, a lot of places are anti-GMO. But I want to point out first off that, that you've experienced a lot more GMOs than you're aware of, but there are many benefits to GMOs too. And so what you have to do is understand this whole process and then decide what makes the most sense for you. And moving a gene from one species to another is not that much different than just selectively breeding for, that, for an allele of that gene, in my opinion. And when you consider that something like the golden rice um, has the potential to benefit a great number of people and improve their nutrition, you know, that's something that, that you could consider a, a very good benefit of GMOs. But like I said, how common are these things? They're more common than you think. So it's not some sort of rare thing that a crazy scientist is doing here or there. They're everywhere. And so I want you to be aware of that. Is that a good thing or a bad thing? Well, you have to decide that. I'm just trying to tell you what I know and that there's lots of transgenic organisms. For example, there's potatoes that have been modified to fight cholera. So this is, again, another example of how you can put a gene into a particular food staple and help um, you know, improve people's diet and, and, and help with the certain diseases simply by splicing that gene in. Um, here in the United States, like I said, most agricultural crops have been modified. And so there's a thing called Roundup Ready corn and soybeans. And so these are plants that have been genetically modified so that you can spray an herbicide on them and that herbicide won't kill them, but it'll kill everything else. Again, we can argue a lot about is that a good thing or a bad thing? That leads to a lot more pesticide use and that can in the long run be a bad thing, right? You need to be aware of that, but, but you need to be aware that that is a huge part of agriculture today. And so you have to decide um, is that a good thing or a bad thing? Uh, there have been goats that have been modified to produce spider silk. And so the silk of spiders coming from a gene, you put that gene in a goat and then they can produce that silk, I guess, in their milk. And so you can mass produce silk a lot cheaper and easier. We can talk about the ethics of something like that, right? These are all very important issues and I don't know that I have an answer for them, but it's important that you understand understand them and understand how this can happen. Um, there have been tobacco plants modified to produce human serum albumin, which is a very important protein in human blood. And so um, to produce mass quantities of this, which is important in medicine, you can splice this gene into a tobacco plant and then harvest it from the tobacco plant. So these are all good examples of GMOs and there's just, there's no end to them. This is a huge, and this is a vastly growing area of biology. The last thing I want to talk about is something called horizontal gene transfer. Or gene transfer between species. Well, that's what we're talking about. GMOs are transferring genes between different species. And that's why a lot of people dislike GMOs. It seems like a phrase you hear often is playing God, or it's Frankenstein, or it's icky. It's not natural. Well, first off, I, you know, I, I could argue that you know, humans, we're organisms like anything else. And so if we do it, how can you say it's not natural? But I understand the sentiment. It's, it's not um, the way the organisms evolved. That's certainly something to consider. Um, and so the idea of taking a single gene from a species and moving it to another species is disturbing to some people. However, I, I'm going to give you some examples. Genes are passed among species all the time. And so a gene moving from one species to another species is not something that humans invented. It's been going on for probably billions of years. We've perfected it, 
and we certainly have an obligation to ethically use this ability but this is something that's been going on for a long time so it's not something we invented uh, so for example horizontal gene transfer is something that's well known in bacteria and so bacteria can exchange dna among species that's very common and so that's been going on for who knows how long there's lots of evidence that bacteria can transfer DNA to their hosts, right? Usually bacteria are infecting some other host, and there's lots of examples where, back, where DNA from that bacterium got into the host genome. And for example, there's a species of bacterium called agrobacterium, and it's so good at transferring DNA to its hosts that that's the go-to bacterium for a lot of genetic engineering. And so if you're trying to get a gene from one species into another species, often you'll put that gene in agrobacterium and infect the other species because agrobacterium, that's their jam. They've been doing this for a long time. They're very good. So this is not something that's uncommon in nature. This is a species that, that's part of their mode of life. There's lots of different ways that DNA can move among species that without human intervention. There's lots of parasitic plants that absorb DNA from their hosts. So, you know, plants that live on other plants. And if you look at their, their genome, you can see that there's genes that are shared between the parasite and its host. And they've been in a close proximity to each other for a long time. And ultimately, the parasite absorbed DNA from its host. Lots of examples of insects transferring genes to their hosts, right? Insects parasitize other organisms and feed off other organisms. And there's lots of examples of DNA being transferred from the insect to their host. We've talked about viruses a lot. <clears throat> a virus is a great way to transfer DNA among species, right? Think about what you know about how viruses work. A virus is just a, you know, some, some genetic material, some DNA or some RNA in a protein coat. It gets into your cell, it inserts its genetic material into, your, into the host genetic material, and then uses the host mechanism to make its own proteins. Well, I mean, here again is an organism, or you know, not really an organism, but here's something that's very good at putting DNA into other DNA. That's what we're talking about here, right? Here's, again, the flu virus. And viruses can accidentally carry a gene sometimes. So the virus, when it inserts itself into the host DNA, it might insert itself next to an existing gene. Then the virus use, you know, makes a bunch of copies of itself. That's what viruses do. But because it's right next to that existing gene, it copies that gene as well that gene gets incorporated into the virus DNA. Of course, what's a virus do? They uh, make lots of copies and then the cell bursts and then eventually they, the virus moves to a new host and inserts itself into the new host. But now it's got that gene from the original host. That's very common and that's how you can move genes from one organism to another. Um, when this happens, you know, the virus inserts itself wherever it wants to insert itself. Sometimes the virus can insert itself into a promoter of the host and change that promoter, which can greatly affect the host. You got an example of this in your evolutionary history. There's a gene that all of you have called amylase. And amylase produces a protein that's an enzyme that helps humans digest starch. Um, and if you look at the promoter for amylase, you can see remnants of a retrovirus, a, a, of a different kind of virus. And so that means that an early human ancestor got infected by this virus. The virus inserted itself into the DNA, into the, the human's DNA, because that's what viruses do. Maybe it wasn't a human, maybe it was a proto-human. And it just so happened to change that promoter, which enhanced the promoter, which enhanced the production of amylase. Now you've got a lot more of this enzyme that helps you digest starch 
Prior to this, humans didn't really use starches very much in their diet. But when this virus changed that promoter, now you've got descendants of that original uh, infected person. Their descendants produce a lot more amylase, which means they can eat a lot more carbohydrates. You've got this whole other new source of energy, which is very important. Now you've got a lot more energy. And so uh, that is very important to the evolution of humans. And it allows you, you know, how do you fuel this big brain? You've got to have a lot of energy. Now you've got a whole other energy source. So this brain can evolve and get bigger. And so part of our evolution can be traced back to a virus being inserted into a particular part of our DNA. And this is everywhere in biology. So this is not an uncommon thing. And it's a fascinating thing, if you ask me. Well, of course, we're talking about GMOs. Let's, let's modify this a virus for genetic therapy. So we talked about cystic fibrosis. And we talked about how that can be caused by certain alleles that don't produce a proper protein. Well, one way that cystic fibrosis can be treated is with um, genetic therapy. And so you have a copy of, of the gene that makes a functioning protein inserted into, um, I'm not sure what kind of virus, a flu virus, maybe a modified flu virus. Um, and so now you've got this good gene in the virus. You infect the patient with that virus. The virus is very good at getting into the cells of your lungs. That's what it does. And as it does that, it carries that good copy of the gene. That good copy of the gene gets incorporated, gets transcribed, gets translated. You can make copies of, uh, good copies of this protein to compensate for those bad copies that the patient might have. So that's kind of the point that I want to make here, right? There's a lot of negative press associated with GMOs. A lot of people view them as bad. But you need to understand what a GMO is. You need to understand they're way more common than you thought. And you need to not have a knee-jerk reaction. Now, there's a lot we can talk about having to do with GMOs. And it's a very complicated process, but they're not automatically bad, in my opinion. And they're, you know, moving genes among species is not an uncommon thing. Humans didn't invent that. Um, and that's the sort of the stuff that I want you to know. I want you to understand um, this whole concept at a little bit deeper level so you can make up your, your mind with a little bit more information. Now, if you really look at GMOs a lot, at least in my opinion, what it seems to me, most of the concerns are ecological or sociological not physiological. And so it's not really uh, much of a concern that this gene is in a different species and that's gonna somehow make you sick. There's not really any, very many good examples of that. Like I said, you're surrounded by GMOs. And, and um, it's, it's, you know, that protein that's being produced is the same protein that's produced in the original species. That doesn't mean there aren't concerns with GMOs. They're just more ecological or sociological. So we talked about how GMOs might compete with native unmodified organisms. That's a serious concern that, that must be addressed. Um, or GMOs breeding with native organisms and then having these uncontrolled movement of the DNA. Okay, that's, um, that's a fair criticism that must be considered. Um, we talked about that you, they might stimulate a greater use of herbicides, and that may or may not be a bad thing. But maybe they don't increase herbicide. In some examples, you might have more herbicide use because you've got something that can tolerate the herbicide. But if you've got uh, like BT corn, you might be able to get away with less insecticide or herbicide. But the point is, is that it's not automatically a bad thing. Um, control of food supplies. That's like a sociological concern, right? That if you can patent an agricultural crop, is that a good idea or a bad idea? These are the things that we need to discuss. But the idea of moving a gene from one species to another, we didn't come up with that. And in my opinion, it's not that big a deal. But there are other issues 
non sort of biological issues or at least non physiological issues that certainly are worth talking about um, GMOs can relieve a lot of ecological concerns right so there's they're not all negative when it comes to ecology you know because fear you know you can grow more food in a smaller area potentially um, but you notice that a lot of these things we're talking about all have to do with uh, you know feeding hungry people feeding a growing planet the growth of humans and our population growth that's the problem and we need to figure that out right and if we're not going to stop the growth of humans then we're going to need things like GMOs to be able to feed everybody but you know the the unchecked growth of the human you know the population growth of humans that's what's having the biggest impact on the planet we need to figure that out you know, so there there are things to worry about but again I don't have the answers I have my opinions um, I just want to convince you that a GMOs are not uncommon B moving genes among species is not uncommon um, C GMOs are not automatically bad and if, if they have an, if they have you know a negative connotation you need to understand what's that connotation but 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 I don't know what am I on D yeah there's a lot we need to talk about this and they're not automatically good either and so anyway I thought this was something important for you guys to know and I hope it kind of ties together a lot of the things we've been talking about I think it's fascinating and like I said we could talk for days about this topic so let me know if you got any questions otherwise I will talk to you later have a great day